Good afternoon once again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the session two of International Safety at Sea Conference. Good to see familiar faces from session one and uh, new faces as well who have joined us this afternoon for session two. As you can see, it's open sitting. It's free uh, for you to move around. So if you'd like to move to the tables in front, you can do that too. My name is Carissa Seed and I'll be your MC for this session. Uh, till the end of the session. So that said, um, it's good to be in the room with you to learn together. Um, as we mentioned and we started with session one, safety is of utmost importance. We did talk about it, but today as we kickstart session two with our new, new friends that have joined us, we're going to be watching a short safety video once again in the event of an emergency. Uh, these are some of the things to take note. So please be patient and let's watch this fire safety video together. Welcome to Park Royal on Beach Road. Please give us your full attention as we show you what to expect when the fire alarm is activated. Fire safety evacuation video. The fire alarm has been activated. We are investigating the situation. Please remain calm and wait for further instruction. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. There exists an emergency situation in the building. Please evacuate by the nearest exit and obey all instructions given by the fire wardens. Remember to avoid the use of lifts. All guests from Grand Ballroom 2 and 3 please exit through the designated fire exit door near to the link bridge. Please evacuate in an orderly manner. Take only your valuables and leave all bulky items behind. All guests from Grand Ballroom 1, Sky Ballroom 1, 2, 3 and boardroom please exit through the designated fire exit doors 9, 10 or 11 leading to the courtyard. Please remain calm and head towards the fire assembly point. Please be careful as you make your way down the stairs. All staff guests customers visitors shall not re-enter the building once at the assembly point unless instructed otherwise by the civil defense officer in attendance. On reaching the assembly area, please take your attendance with the staff present. If you are feeling unwell or need any medical attention, please inform the staff present. Thank you for your kind attention and have a nice day. Welcome to... Thank you very much for your attention and I believe we all remain calm in the event of an emergency. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen, we are proper and able to start session two together. Uh, I hope that you had time to visit the networking booths outside. Did you have? Oh, I, I see a couple that, mm, but I enjoyed the food and the coffee a lot better. <laughs> so you know what? We hope that you enjoyed the hospi hospitality as well. And of course, I think many of the booths are bringing um, some very interesting technology and how that can be integrated into, you know, the work that you do to elevate and increase safety as well. Um, that said, um, we are now ready to actually open up this session to with an award presentation. We are going to present the International Safety at Sea Awards to two outstanding companies for their contributions to search and rescue efforts in 2022. For this, I'll be inviting on stage our Chairman of National Maritime Safety at Sea Council, Mr. Ishak Ismail, to join us as our presenter. Mr. Ishak, please, welcome back. Please join me here on stage. You have an important job to give out the uh, awards. And there are two companies. Important indeed. I'm going to just have you positioned somewhere there in this right. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that said, um, the first award goes to NYK Ship Management Private Limited. Please allow me to share more. Just a moment, NYK Ship Management Private Limited and the master and crew of Helios Leader are being recognized for their role in a challenging search and rescue operation amidst adverse weather conditions on 7 November 2022. Now, more than 300 people were rescued from a sinking boat in the South China Sea, and they were brought on board the ship more than four hours after it received the distress message from MRCC Singapore. So for that, we'd like to say congratulations and thank Thank you for your good work. Well, to receive this award, I'd like to invite on stage Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer of NYK Ship Management Private Limited, Mr. Anubhav Gag. Congratulations and thank you for your good work.
And next, I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of our next recipient. This recipient is Pacific International Lines. Let me share a bit more about them. Now, Pacific International Lines and the master and crew of Kota Surya are being recognized for the assistance rendered after responding to a distress message of West Africa in the Gulf of Guinea on 9 April 2022. And despite the security risk in this location, they deviated from course for about four hours before they found and rescued the entire crew of a cargo vessel that had stopped at sea due to water ingress and flooding of the engine room. Now, Kota Surya only resumed its voyage seven days after the survivors disembarked at Cape Town. And for this, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to acknowledge Pacific International Lines. Let's welcome on stage the CEO of Pacific International Lines, Mr. Lars Kastrup. With him, Master Captain Sehik Idin. Welcome, sir. Welcome, gentlemen. Congratulations to all our winners. Thank you, Mr. Yishak, for acknowledging and giving out the awards. And indeed, our everyday heroes, unsung heroes. Um, that's it. We really appreciate the good work um, that you do out at sea. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will be turning the stage uh, around for this next segment. We are going to be also turning our attention now to Operation operationalizing methanol bunkering, which is our topic for session two. Now, the interest in methanol as an alternative fuel for bunkering has grown in the shipping industry as we all work together to move towards net zero emissions by 2050. Now, in July this year, Musk and Honglam Marine successfully conducted the world's first ship-to-container ship methanol bunkering operation of a Musk container vessel at the Raffles reserved anchorage here in Singapore. And this is done with the support of MPA, government agencies, as well as research institutes. So today, we're so pleased that we have um, in this room with us the experts involved to share their experience of operationalizing Singapore's first methanol bunkering operation. And how we're going to be doing this format is that our speakers will be each presenting a 10-minute presentation on their own. And after we've heard all our speakers share, we will then invite them back on stage. As you can see, we're setting up for a panel discussion together. And before we do go into that as well, this is also where we'll get you to participate by uh, sending in your questions through Pigeonhole. You can do this by scanning the QR code that's behind your name badges or later we will be flashing the QR code on stage as well. Okay, it looks like we're all set. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to welcome first up to take the stage. Um, speaking with us will be Captain Jagadisan, Nat uh, Jagadisan Natarajan. He's the General Manager for Orient Marine Corporation Limited. Let's welcome him, please. Good evening, all. So much crowd is here because we thought uh, evening session will be less crowd. But uh, today I see the evening session so with uh, more number of people here. Thank you very much. So about OMC, like uh, I just go there. One second. Sorry. So we are the company formed in uh, 1988. We are a part of a Michi group. It's not uh, Michio and Co. Japan, so we are a one-stop solution provider. Means, uh, I'll just go to the next slide. So that means uh, we do everything in shipping. That means uh, we do ship broking, ship chartering, as well as uh, sales and purchase, new building supervision, marine and technical consultation services. Also we do ship financing and also does act as a consultant to IT consultant. So what you do is, like uh, for example, 
here now you can see our portfolio like we are controlling around uh, more than 500 ships that means uh, we own some of the ships as well as uh, we are chartering and brokered almost close to more than 550 ships. This is a figure of April 2023. So now another 50 or 60 ships increased. Another uh, 100 vessels in progress means uh, for the chartering and brokering service. And also we own, as another entity is here called OMC Shipping Private Limited. We own around uh, six vessels now. In the past, we used to own around 33 ships, but uh, now due to the good market conditions, we sold most of the ships. So now we are operating only six ships as a owning entity in Singapore. And then we are also one of the largest sales and purchase brokers in Japan. That means uh, if you see 100 ships has been sold from Japanese owners, out of which half of the percentage is sold by us. So this is our strength for us. And also we have a sales and ship missionary sales and purchase department. We deal with the BWTS, we, do, uh, we deal with the ESDs, energy saving devices, etc. And another department is uh, like, uh, as I told, finance department. We also do a lot of uh, sales and leaseback scheme and JALCO schemes out of Japan. So this is our strength. So this is our parent company, Mitsui. So because people might be asking why Mitsui is there in the methanol bunkering session. So I have to explain a little bit about our Mitsui. So Mitsui is a member of uh, Musk Mechali Mono Center. As well as we have a joint venture with the shipyard Yangtze Zhang shipbuilding called Yamik. And also we work with, like uh, our colleagues from Moscow here, so we work with the joint venture projects with the Musk, MOL, NYK, and other people. And also on the ESD side, we have Bering A, which we have a stake in the Bering A, which is similar to our uh, artificial intelligence based, means weather routing services as well as uh, CA, EEXI, everything. So currently we are claiming that it works up to 95% accuracy. Going forward, we are thinking about 98% accuracy so that such weather routing service will provide. In other side, we as a OMC work with the ship machinery division. So I have mentioned all the whom you are working with. Also we do the new building and the technical consultancy service. We support Japanese owners on the new building side from start delivery, as well as from the chartering, fixing them for the ship and then once a ship is out of the charter, we do the SNP services. That is what I mentioned over here. Now I'll go to the main subject. Why Michu is involved? Because it has all started in July 2021, because the first methanol bunkering is done in 2023, but we started this discussion with the MPA in, first discussion with the MPA on this in July 2021. Because the inspiration is the first methanol bunkering between a tanker and a barge done at Rotterdam in May, 10th May 2021. Everybody knows the name of the company here. I can see Captain Anubhav Garg is here. He knows <laughs> Takaro San and the others. One. The inspiration started from here. Then we meet you as a discussion because the reason being is we have a separate division called Michu Energy Trading Division as well as we have a Michu Chemical Division. We deal with the methanol, ammonia, who, whichever fuel you name it, we deal with every fuel in the world. Okay. So that is the reason we started on methanol first to start, okay, how to start this one. So when you started in November 2021, we proposed to MPA that we'll start with the first STS operation because we want to do a trial in methanol bunkering as a STS operation. MPA is very happy, means uh, okay, you can do the trial, but they preferred it should be a methanol dual fuel vessel because which is using methanol as a fuel because uh, that is a, Point, important point, they stressed on this point. Okay, they don't want to do a normal STS operation because that can be done anywhere in Singapore or anything. They have experience in that one. But they want to first do it as a methanol dual fuel. Means the vessel is using methanol as a fuel. So the problem started here. <laughs> Where to find a methanol dual fuel vessel? So that time, nothing, uh, no, uh, because we have the methanol tankers operating, but they are taking the cargo, actually they are using the fuel from the cargo tank. Okay, so they are in operations for almost last five years or six years, yes. I guess the first uh, tanker, I think, in 2016, Methanex is the forefront leader in that one. So they are operating a long time. But to find a methanol dual fuel ship, which is using methanol as a means directly from a bunker tank as a fuel, very difficult. So there, we started thinking then Musk, they announced there all the projects like Musk fuel. So we started discussion with Musk. 
as well as the important partner missing here is uh, Musk Oil Trading. They are also one of the Musk Group company. So they are, we collaborate with Musk Oil Trading. And then we are trying to source some of them who want to supply methanol to this ship. So we initially started off working with uh, chemical tanker operators who is operating a methanol because there is no dedicated methanol bunker barge in Singapore. Maybe the new SL might be delivered this month or next month, I don't know. So there is one of the operator. But at that time, 2022, when you start a discussion, there is no proper operators are here. So we thought, okay, we'll engage a chemical tanker operator to do this operation. Uh, but once again, the chemical, uh, chemical tanker operator, if you use them, then the issue here is uh, they are the foreign traders, like no, they are not related to Singapore waters. So if you see in February, this is the status of our project. In 1st of February 2023, this is the status. Still, we have not decided who is going to supply the, which is the operator, who is the operator going to supply the first methanol bunkering to the mask vessel. But mask vessel delivery is confirmed in June or July. So this is the status on 1st of February. But we are working side by side with MPA, how to develop like uh, operational manual as well as guidelines and everything. But this is the status on 1st of February. Then this is a timeline. Like uh, for example, Hong Lam come into the picture around the middle of February. So because the reason being is, Hong Lam is one of the experienced bunker barge operator. And the advantage of them is they are also operating a chemical tankers. So this is the most advantageous position for us also. And uh, we discussed with them as well as MOT. Main discussion party is between Musk Oil Trading and uh, Hong Lam. So they decided together, and we as a collaborator among them. So we done this. So we all come together. And then what happened is, I don't go into the detail of this one because uh, Samuel will be presenting on this in more detail. So I don't go detail in this one. So this one we have seen in 27th of July. All this happened. So what you have done as a mature group is, we just prepared a basic like, okay, Musk has its own operational manual for bunkering. Hanglam has its own cargo transfer manual for doing any cargo transfers. But we have to make a general guideline, correct? So what we have done is, we mature collaborated with all the parties, prepared a operational guidelines, what to, in the context of Singapore waters. Because we already have NOK as prepared, I know NYK has prepared an extensive guideline for operating in Rotterdam for that operations. So, but in a, it is a different contest like in Singapore water because they've done the bunkering operation at the berth. But here we are going to do as a STS operation means at the anchorage. So we prepared in that contest operation guidelines as well as the basic risk assessment and the hazard identification. Then we worked with Musk as well as Hang Lam, as well as uh, my friend in ABS. We've been, so we all worked together and prepared the contest because we have to answer a lot of questions from MPA because MPA is a regulatory authority. I have to thank Captain Dakshinas also in this aspect because when he had the ACID meeting, so he has also asked us a lot of questions. Okay, what is what will happen in case if it, something happened like this? So all this put together and we prepare the operational guidelines as well as the, I think one minute is left, okay. <laughs> So, so 27th July, yeah, the first methanol bunkering operation is happened. So we thank all the parties involved because uh, it is a team coordination. First of all, I have to thank all the parties like Hang Lam, ABS, Musk, MPA. Without their support, this operation will not be in uh, place. Thank you very much. That's all from my side. Thank you, uh, Captain Jagadeesan Natarajan, for taking the stage and sharing more. Look forward to speaking with you at the panel session. Um, next, to take the stage, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Samuel Su. He is the Senior Di Deputy Director, Marine Services of Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. Mr. Samuel Su, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Samuel from MPA. So let's just start. So today I'll be sharing with you uh, several aspects um, on Singapore's first ship to container ship methanol bunkering. 
uh, the preparation that was done to ensure that the bunkering operation was carried out safely and effectively. And I think uh, we've just heard from Mitsi how they started the project. Uh, from our perspective, uh, today what I'll be sharing is mostly from the Port Authority's ex perspective. And our key concern as a Port Authority is to ensure that Singapore was ready to handle any unforeseen incident that might arise from the operation. And I'll also highlight some areas that need to be addressed for safe methanol bunkering in the future. So we looked at some past incidents, if you see on the screen. Some of these incidents, they are not related to bunkering, but they do show the importance of safe handling of methanol. And that's why MPA, together with our partners, we had to do a lot of extensive preparation for the methanol bunkering operation. And the other value of looking at past incidents is to look at the causes of such incidents. For example, here you'll notice that there are mention of lightning strike here, which I will touch on again later. Now, why are we looking at methanol bunkering? Um, other than the fact that um, there is demand for it, the larger picture we have to keep in mind today is that meeting the IMO's emission reduction target means a multi-fuel transition for shipping. And one of these fuels will be methanol. Um, on the details of the methanol pathway, I think some of the other speakers will touch on this later, so I won't go into detail on that. I'll just add that as a large bunkering port, Singapore ourselves, we have an important role in supporting the decarbonisation effort of the shipping industry as a whole. And we have to work closely with our stakeholders as well as other administrations to ensure that we are able to safely bunker these new fuels. Now, one thing I want to highlight here, also mentioned on the slide, is that methanol is commonly transported today already as cargo, but not as a fuel. So I think as uh, Captain Adaraja also mentioned, um, we're not new... Singapore as a port is not new to methanol. In 2022, we already completed more than 70 loading and discharging operations, but these are for industrial use. So there are already storage tanks and berths that can handle methanol in Singapore. But the real challenge is when it comes to bunkering. Because as mentioned here, when it comes to bunkering, the vessel that is receiving the bunker may not be a tanker. The crew competency in handling the chemicals also differs. And then the bunkering environment will not be controlled, will not be the same as when it's done at the terminal, when you do it at Anchorage. So here in Singapore, we have a methodology to guide our preparations for this operation. We covered risk, uh, risk assessment, safety assessment, uh, coordination between the government agencies, that's very important, because if anything happens, we have to respond. We also looked at developing capability for plume modelling, and also methanol training for the crew and frontline officers. And this would be a similar approach that we'll use for other alternative fuels as well. Now, I think uh, Mitsui shared some of the very early uh, preparation activities that was done by industry in trying to get partners together. What you see here is actually the activities that MPA had to do with, with our partners. And there's a lot of planning behind the scenes. So there was a, here you see an overview of the more recent activities starting from about April this year. Uh, includes tabletop exercise, uh, hazard hazard workshops where we discussed the risks uh, we had to do firefighting training, uh, trials of the drones and the sensors, modeling as well, and a ground deployment exercise. And I, you notice the timeline seems um, like a lot of activities in a very short amount of time. So here I just want to stress that we have to thank all our partners, uh, other government agencies, the industry, and other stakeholders such as research institutes as well for helping us along all this way. Just want to touch a bit on some of the particular key activities. So we had a tabletop exercise in April during ICOPC 2023 during Maritime Week, which was also attended by the IMO site gen. And this was mainly to start off by looking at what are existing safety measures for normal bunkering and what needs to be strengthened. Then we had a hazard hazard workshop where stakeholders involved in the actual bunkering operation, together with the government agencies, came together to identify risks and consider how to develop the mitigation measures and we also developed uh, quite a few checklists and a bunkering procedure manual. Now, the bunkering operation, of course, we hope that it goes well. But if anything goes wrong, government agencies will need to respond to a spill. So we had a ground deployment exercise just to make sure that the agencies ourselves or our SOPs are in place and we understand them. Now, in parallel with these, we had a few sessions of a methanol-specific firefighting course for the MPA frontline officers and the crew of the tanker that will be delivering the methanol. And it's primarily to highlight to participants that it's not the same as a normal bunkering operation. If a fire occurs, you have to respond differently. And this is very critical because 
Instinctively, most of the crew would respond as per the generic safety, generic firefighting course that they would have undergone as part of their seafarer training. And the key thing about methanol is that it's highly flammable. It has a low flash point. And the other thing I want to highlight here is that it has a colorless flame. So it's not the same as a normal fire. I'd like to show a video. Let's see if it works. Okay. This video shows the methanol firefighting training that was carried out for the crew. And the key thing here is to uh, enhance the crew's awareness that the flame is invisible. So you see here that you can't really see the flame. Uh, and the actual impact is felt differently when you actually attend the training and see that something is burning even though the flame cannot be visible. The other thing we did during this is that we used, we bought, we had to try out different thermal cameras to see whether they actually detect the flame. So you see that the camera could detect the flame even though there was no visible flame. Here we tried to extinguish the fire using water. So a methanol fire can be extinguished by water, but it actually requires a lot more water than a typical oil fire. So you see that even though water is spraying, you can still see the flame burning with the thermal camera. So that's basically it. But of course, this is not the end of the training. It's not the final say on the training. We have to continue to enhance what are the crew training requirements going forward. And so in MPA, we will continue to develop the cross curriculum and make this available in due time. So here I'll just show some pictures. I think the speakers later will be going into detail on some of the operational matters. But I'd just like to show that uh, we had to consider how the vessel goes alongside host connection. During the actual operation, MP also convened uh, EOC, Emergency Operations Center, just to monitor the operation. And another important thing to note was the disconnection. So as I mentioned, there are several aspects that we had to do when we considered the risk assessment. But I think uh, some of the speakers later will go into them. So these are the, some of the mitigation measures that we put in place after our risk assessment. So one thing I want to highlight here is that as most of you, if you are from Singapore, you would know that we are a very lightning-prone city, and lightning strikes are very frequent in our port waters. So one of the differences from normal bunkering is that we had to put in place lightning alerts, and also we uh, procured lightning detectors. They, we also needed intrinsically safe thermal cameras, and the bunker hoses had to be equipped with uh, QCDC and DBC, so in case of any um, disconnection, there will be minimal spill and we also needed methanol detectors and chemical suits. So during the operation itself, MPA had to deploy our assets, and at the same time, we took the opportunity to test new technology. For example, if you look at the lower right-hand uh, image, that's basically a picture uh, using a thermal camera that is on the drone during the actual bunkering operation. We also took this opportunity to do modeling, uh, which affects how we deploy our assets. Another thing that we tried to do this time round was we looked at modeling. So we worked with quite a few of our local institutes of higher learning, such as the Tropical Marine Science Institute, the Technology Center for Offshore and Marine, ASTAR, the Cambridge Center for Advanced Research and Education in Singapore, and NTU's Maritime Energy and Sustainable Development Center of Excellence, as well as our own port chemists and hydrographers to come up with models. So what you see in this slide is um, a model by TMSI on weather. So this doesn't show the actual date of the bunkering operation. What they did was they did models for days before the operation to see whether it could accurately predict the weather. We also looked at the prediction of currents. So TCONS provided this uh, model on water current. So what this allows us to do is we can see what is the optimal window for bunkering where the current is maximum so that if, there, if any spill does occur and some of it goes overboard, it will be dispersed um, faster. And we also had ASTAR did a plume dispersion model using computational fluid dynamics. 
uh, basically this is a more detailed model of how the plume uh, uh, will disperse, taking into account the ship, um, the ship structure and so on. And our end goal is that in the event of an emergency, these models can act as decision-making tools for the first responders once they are developed fully. So part of this is also allowed to, what we did is that we took real-time data on the day and this allowed the researchers to validate their modeling inputs, uh, modeling outputs and refine the models going forward. Now here I want to touch on uh, something where what we did after the operation is that we also tried to share the learnings with the maritime community. Singapore has submitted a paper to the IMO, uh, C committee for discussion and we also will be using some of these learning points to develop methanol bargaining standards in Singapore. And we, besides, of course, the companies that were involved in the bargaining operation, we do have a lot more bunker craft operators in Singapore, and we have also already had an engagement session with them to share the learning points in September. Now, I just want to highlight here some of the challenges to be addressed by the maritime community. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, methanol has unique properties that the crew needs to be aware of, so we do see that there may be a need to enhance the STCW training requirements, especially when it comes to uh, methanol firefighting. We also need to look at testing of methanol for quality. Currently, most people in the industry uh, refer to a reference pack by the International Methanol Producers and Consumers Association, but that's really meant for methanol as cargo. So there may, we need to refine this when it comes to methanol as marine fuel. We need to look at uh, vessel compatibility for methanol bunkering. So the methanol bunker tankers have to be designed properly to meet safety requirements, while at the same time allowing the bunkering to take place efficiently and to achieve the standard pumping rate. And we need to consider things like how to handle the collected vapor, uh, whether you have e uh, emergency shutdown connections and so on, and whether you need nitrogen generators on board. So we have submitted some of these takeaways in a paper to the IMO. Uh, we also did a lunchtime presentation at the IMO, similar to what you, we shared today. So some of the other considerations we highlighted uh, comes to ship design. For example, the venting arrangements, uh, because most of the requirements for venting arrangements today are for ships carrying methanol as cargo, but that may not work on a container vessel where the deck is full of containers. Uh, there's a need for ships to have fire detection devices. And basically, the bunker tankers that are going to be used to develop, develop, deliver methanol have to consider some of these additional safety and operational aspects, even at the de design phase. So we will be continuing the discussion with IMO and other member states and continue to share our learning points. So that basically brings me to the end of the presentation, and I would just like to thank everyone for their attention. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Samuel Su. That really opened my eyes to what goes into, uh, you know, this whole thing. I read it in the news, but I never knew there was so much that went on behind it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, well, our next speaker that will be taking the stage is Mr. Vibin Chandra Bose. He is the Principal Engineer, Sustainability Global, Sustainability Center, Singapore, of American Bureau of Shipping. So we will hand the time over to him to share more in his presentation and later he'll join us once again for the panel session. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Vibin. I'm principal engineer with ABS's sustainability team uh, based in Singapore. Uh, I'll talk to you about methanol bunkering, and I'll focus on the topics of supply chain and the regulations part. And uh, I'll come to some of the challenges that we face in these operations. Now, uh, any type of methanol grade is not an effective CO2 reducer, so it's only the greener version that will give you a significant reduction in your GHG ratings. So what we are looking for is basically the use of green methanol. Uh, so biomethanol and e-methanol are the typical green, uh, green versions of methanol that we want to use in the maritime sector. 
So uh, biomethanol is nothing but uh, any biomass uh, which is processed using green electricity that gives you the biomethanol. And uh, when you're using green electricity for hydrogen production uh, together with the CO2 capture, that gives you uh, the e-methanol version. Uh, but if you're, if you're actually looking at the fossil version of methanol, it's more damaging uh, to the environment uh, than the traditional diesel fuel. Uh, this chart here gives you a, a idea of the GHG well-to-wake ratings uh, for methanol in comparison with the uh, regular fuels. So if you benchmark it against the diesel uh, oil, uh, you can see the fossil version is roughly around 10% uh, higher than the, the diesel oil itself. And it's only the biomethanol and the e-methanol that gives you a significant reduction. Uh, the biomethanol, it contributes to about 65% less GHG emissions. And the e-methanol one is the one uh, which gives you about 90% reduction in your GHG emissions. Uh, Price-wise, uh, again, uh, please uh, don't take these numbers for granted. Uh, I multiple websites show different values. So at least, at least uh, what we can rely on is the price of the fossil methanol. So those, those numbers were pretty uh, standardized or harmonized across different platforms. Uh, and the price of fossil methanol was very relatable to the diesel oil prices. Uh, so it's pretty much within those range. Uh, but it, it's not an effective contributor to the CO2 reduction. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, if you are taking any form of green methanols, uh, it's about 1.5 to 4 times uh, costlier than your traditional fuel oils. Uh, for the methanol availability, uh, the key resource finder is uh, the website by Methanol Institute. Uh, so this website has a specific or dedicated page for renewable methanol or the green methanol. And if you go to this website, there is a world map where it shows the facilities uh, which are actually producing the biomethanol and the e-methanol versions. And uh, there are several pointers uh, on this map. And when you click on these pointers, uh, you get the uh, list of companies, the production capacity. And if it is a proposed project, it shows you the startup year of the project uh, and things like that. Uh, the pointer I clicked on uh, this particular snapshot is uh, about Singapore. So when I click, you can see actually the companies that are participating in this methanol production in Singapore. And uh, from the feedstock, you can actually see that uh, it's a kind of e-methanol that we are going to uh, produce here. So the hydrogen is from the electrolysis uh, process and the CO2 is biogenic, so it's probably a carbon capture. Uh, from uh, incinerating the municipal waste here. Uh, this is a product, uh, projected uh, methanol or green methanol production capacity, uh, which is available again in the Methanol Institute website. So uh, biomethanol will be more more available in re, uh, in these years. But I think I think once the e-methanol facilities uh, start operating, the share of e-methanol will be significantly higher. Uh, fuel certification wise, uh, currently we don't have any mandatory requirement for this certification. Uh, but since, since the future uh, monitoring of GHG is based on the life cycle of fuels, certification schemes like the ISCC uh, will be a basic requirement. So ISCC certification, uh, it's uh, based on the EU, uh, EU directive and it will show you records of emission uh, at different stages of the fuel, uh, right from production to transportation to the actual use of the fuel. So uh, this certification will soon be a basic requirement in your, uh, along with your BDNs. Now on the regulatory part of the vessel design, uh, on the supply vessel side, it's pretty straightforward. We are, we are going to follow the IBC code for methanol. Uh, there, there are some amendments to the IBC code with methanol being listed as more toxic now and 
uh, there will be some additional requirements uh, coming in. Uh, on the receiving vessel side, which is burning the methanol fuel, uh, the IGF code applies, and followed by the MSE circular 1621, uh, which is uh, speci specific requirements or guidelines for methanol and ethanol fuel ships. Uh, but these two uh, together, they, they don't uh, exclude the risk assessment totally, so there is some form of uh, risk assessment, especially for the fuel system being done for the vessel design itself. Uh, but this one pretty much uh, is covered during the construction stage or the design stage of the vessel, and it's uh, the flag requirements and the class requirements are pretty much covered during this uh, stage. On the operation side of it, uh, again, uh, CMOPS, uh, which includes the bunkering and the cargo operations, that's the ultimate objective so that we can have an uh, economically uh, sensible uh, shipping operation. Uh, but again, uh, our reliance for uh, safe operations is definitely on prescriptive standards for these operations, uh, which we don't have yet. So we are going through the phase of uh, risk assessment, uh, which includes tabletop exercises and hazard has of uh, workshops before we can actually go uh, or publish a very prescriptive uh, safety standard. But uh, yeah, this is, this is again a work in progress. Uh, so typical risk assessment is basically to identify any kinds of uh, hazards uh, for different kinds of operations. So uh, when you are taking bunkering, the SDS mooring, or the connection and testing of hoses, the draining arrangement, those are some of the things that needs to be studied. Uh, when you are talking about cargo handling, uh, it's the loading and loading procedures. Uh, and the sequence of loading and loading, uh, that is something that needs to be taken care of. Uh, again, uh, the risk assessment workshop will also give you some projections on uh, major incidents, like if you have a, a significant incident of leakage, uh, what are the consequences to the immediate ecosystem, uh, and what kind of preparedness and mitigation me mitigating measures uh, we need to consider uh, is something what uh, uh, is an outcome of the risk assessment. So uh, things like uh, if you look at the bunkering stage itself, you can see there is a, a DBC, which we call the dry breakaway coupling, uh, that there is a, a QCDC, which is the cube connect disconnect coupling. And uh, outside, outside of the methanol cargo line, there is a vapor return line back to the uh, bunker vessel. And there is also a ESD link, uh, which is uh, used by the receiving vessel to shut down the cargo pumps of the bunker vessel. So these are the three physical links, uh, other than the mooring uh, that is being used for bunkering. And major, major uh, hazard identification happens around these places. And we need to find all the mitigating measures and safety requirements and preparedness for these operations. Uh, Challenges-wise, uh, of course, any new operations uh, comes with a lot of uncertainties. Uh, so technology readiness-wise, I would say uh, the engine uh, availability uh, was the hardest nut to crack. But now, now this is available, so we can always see new players, new vendors coming into play. Uh, I would say, I would say the technology-wise, uh, we are semi-mature and it's mostly the optimization part which is uh, happening now. Uh, standards are training, uh, standards and training, again, uh, uh, methanol is not nothing new that we are handling, it's being handled as a cargo, but we need to refine those available standards and procedures uh, so that we can use the same safety level when introducing methanol to engine rooms and for training crew, uh, in handling methanol on board. Uh, retrofit feasibility-wise, it's a very vessel-specific uh, study. So we, we identify multiple cases, uh, like uh, let's, say, let's say if you're retrofitting coffer dams into the existing vessels, there is a, a, a loss in volume of the fuel tanks. So whether the new vessel uh, or the new voyage endurance makes sense uh, makes any business sense uh, for, for their operations. 
those are studied or in some, time, some cases uh, we need to install external tanks or increase the length of the vessel or the length of the tank to accommodate or to maintain the uh, voyage endurance of the vessel. So uh, those kind of things is what uh, is being studied up until the retrofit uh, stage. Uh, but again, uh, these are mere hurdles and it doesn't, uh, the science is already there. So uh, it doesn't actually uh, kind of, uh, how to say, uh, the technology is already ready, I would say. But it's mostly the financial part, which is a big, big uh, roadblock for most of the uh, ship owners. And that, that's when, when they want to take a kind of a step back approach after the retrofit study, because uh, not every ship owner has that money muscle to, you know, uh, to adjust to that uh, higher or three times, four times the price of uh, fuel or even, even a 10, 15 percentage of new build cost for the retrofits. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's mostly the industry leaders who are going to pave the way for that. And it will be, uh, yeah, the followers will subsequently follow when the market is ready for it. Uh, the major costs, again, it's, uh, again, the supply demand cycle for methanol. Uh, once, once the uh, cycle starts spinning a bit faster, the prices will be more reasonable and yeah, that, that's, that's when it, it will be a more economical option to uh, transfer. Uh, that's all with my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bibin, for that. And I really appreciate the various um, observations of uh, our speakers giving us something food for thought before the actual panel kicks in. The next speaker to take the stage is Mr. Dinesh Kumar Balraj. He is Senior Director of Head of Fleet Operations East, AP Molomarsk. Uh, let's welcome Mr. Dinesh on stage, please. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. When our brand new methanol enabled vessel was launched from its uh, South Korean shipyard in July 2023, it wasn't just a maiden voyage for a new vessel. It was world's first voyage on a methanol powered vessel. It was the first time that we bunkered green methanol. First time we called ports with a fuel for which there was no operational procedures or regulations. It required tremendous effort and collaboration, not just within Musk, but externally with all the stakeholders to ensure that the vessel safely bunkered for the first time in Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be able to share our experiences and learnings from this bunkering at this Safety and Sea Forum. As a leader in an industry that contributes to the planet's biggest problem, climate change, we take the lead in pushing boundaries towards a cleaner, greener environment. We are committed to decarbonizing our global operations by 2040 across our entire business. This is a decade ahead of industry ambitions. We have a target to reduce 50% in emission intensity from our 2020 baselines. And we have a target to carry 
25% of our ocean cargo using green fuel. I think the speakers before me uh, spoke uh, a lot about how uh, the different p pathways for producing green methanol, but I'll just quickly say that it can be produced using three pathways, of which two lead to biomethanol and one leads to e-methanol. Biomethanol is produced from biomass, while e-methanol synthesizes the biomet uh, biomass using renewable energy, such as wind or solar. This slide basically shows the three solutions that can solve the climate, climate challenge. At Musk, we believe green methanol and biodiesel are the only certain scalable fuels with significant impact for this decade. When developing future fuel supply, we strive to reduce emissions across the life cycle of the fuel as much as possible, and not just the emissions associated with our own operations. We needed to break the chicken and egg problem. Well, there was no infrastructure for using methanol on vessels. We decided to accelerate our uh, decarbonization of the fleet starting with Laura Musk in 2023, and we've ordered a further 12 carbon neutral vessels for 2024 and 2025. Apart from this, we have six other vessels for delivery in 2025. Most of you have uh, seen uh, Laura Musk in action. This is a vessel that is of 2,100 TEU capacity, running on dual fuel, and had her maiden voyage recently where we bunkered for the first time in Singapore. A fun fact is Laura Musk will be saving up to 100 tons of CO2 per day compared to sister vessels sailing on heavy fuels. And this way she really marks the beginning of a new era in the shipping industry. This is our next generation of carbon neutral vessels called the Equinox series, which are six, 16,000 TU vessels. They will be 20% more energy efficient than industry standards. So in this slide, we'll talk about the bunkering challenges uh, that we can expect from methanol. Many of the speakers talked about the low flash point at 11 degrees Celsius. Due to the low flash point, it is also a high uh, fire hazard. They are highly flammable and pose a signific significant fire and explosion hazard if not handled properly. There is also effort needed to control the vapor. So the vapor return line uh, has to be sent back to the barge, unlike the traditional bunkering. Inhalation of vapor uh, is, is not toxic if, if it is in smaller quantities. Of course, at larger quantities, it, it can become an issue. Uh, so so this, is, this is a concern. Ingestion, eye contact, skin contact are uh, is, is where the problems are. We also need to then monitor uh, through CCTV uh, systems and uh, methanol detection systems. Uh, personal methanol detectors will be used by personnel involved in bunkering with a set point of around 250 ppm uh, so that the detector uh, can alarm uh, the user. We also need to segregate the uh, uh, bunkering areas uh, in, in terms of zones. So we have a hazardous zone of 10 meter where you need to have a certain PPE and fire fighting equipment. 
you have to have a 20 meter safety zone where the lightning fixtures need to be grounded. And during bunker operations, there shouldn't be any cargo operations in the 20 meter hazardous zone. And then we'll also need to have a security zone of 100 meter as required by the local regulations where no other vessel will be allowed apart from the bunkering vessel. We'll also need to have the emergency shutdown system. Uh, we've been already covered this, so I wouldn't go into the detail. But also, we have, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, the flammability, the fire burns blue at night, and at daytime, it is almost invisible. We saw a good video on this as well. So we'll need to use FLIR cameras uh, to detect fires. We also need to have the quick connect and disconnect couplings on both the liquid and the vapor lines, and a dry breakaway coupling in case of uh, breakaway from the barge. In terms of spill and storage, the procedures are different compared to conventional fuels. Ethanol cannot, cannot be recovered from ocean. It is highly miscible and will dissolve immediately. Hence, containing the spread or recovering spilled methanol into water is impossible. Biodegradable, and it will also evaporate uh, over time. Onboard spill procedures will vary, but it is mostly around uh, containment and dilution with water. In terms of uh, storage, more planning is required so uh, the dangerous cargo are not stored closer uh, to the hazardous zone. I think we already covered the mooring compatibility study from the previous speaker, so I wouldn't go into that in the interest of time. We also had to define operational procedures uh, uh, as a preparation to methanol bunkering. So here, the overarching principle is that it has to be in additional to existing procedures. Methanol-specific procedures have been added to existing bunkering checklists and debunkering checklist. The other speakers also covered the hazard and hazard studies uh, that has been done in preparation for this uh, bunkering. Apart from this, uh, the methanol fuel regulations require, uh, as the other speaker covered, uh, the quick connect and disconnect couplings, breakaway couplings, and emergency sh shutdown systems. And then in terms of crew training, the training of the vessel's crew is governed by international conventions, STCW. There is no special training requirements that is existing for methanol. So we actually had to customize based on IGF training. Methanol is also treated similarly uh, to other marine fuels. So specific training for engineering officers on operational aspects, including leaks and fires, were done. And then generic training on firefighting were provided. As seen in the uh, video that was shared previously by Samuel, crew were exposed to actual uh, firefighting on a, on a methanol uh, fire. And then we also have formed an internal uh, working group that has identified standard training requirements. This slide actually talks about the challenge we face as an industry. I mean, if we were to uh, decarbonize our entire fleet, then we will uh, need large uh, quantities of methanol, which is a challenge. But having said that, with the partnerships and collaborations with the stakeholders, we believe this problem can be solved. That's all from my side. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Dinesh, for that presentation and sharing. Our final speaker before we get into panel is Captain Kamal Hossein. He is the team lead for Marine Operations, Hong Lam Marine. Let's welcome Captain Kamal on stage.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Captain Kamal from Honglam Marine. Operationalizing uh, methanol bunkering. I will talk about uh, operational prospect. Before I move into the operational prospect, let me have a quick introduction of Honglam Marine. Honglam Marine, we are a, a Singapore registered company established in 1981. We are operating a regional vessel carrying uh, chemical products, asphalt. We are operating two jet carriers carrying jet fuels for Singapore airport, uh, namely Kafai Terminal through Kafai Terminals. We are operating 15 bunker tankers, fully equipped with a mass flowmeter. We are also operating uh, a lube oil tankers, three of them, in Singapore ports. Uh, we are operating uh, not only in Singapore, we are also operating in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Southeast Asia. Honglam's mission is to provide good values for its clients and to be recognized for its safe an efficient operation. This is the picture actually uh, represents uh, the whole picture of bunkering or methanol bunkering operation. That's what we worked uh, tirelessly for last uh, couple of months before it happens on 27th of July, 2023. As uh, my colleagues, all uh, previous speakers, they have uh, given a brief description. I will touch base on the operational aspects of uh, this uh, methanol bunkering. We actually, actually divided this total operation into six segments. Approaching mooring, connection and testing, bunker delivery, draining, purging, and disconnection, unmooring depressure, and then others. Others includes crew training, a methanol-specific firefighting, and methanol-specific safety items. For approaching and mooring, I understand for bunker tankers operator or for bunker tankers is pretty pretty simple, I mean pretty common uh, for a uh, bunker tanker operation. But when we talk about uh, methanol bunkering, and also that's the first time going to happen in Singapore waters, we took a very serious approach on it. And in collaboration with Marx, we carried out a mooring compatibility study, uh, ext an extensive study how to carry out mooring with this uh, container ship, uh, Laura Marx, and our uh, tanker vessel, Agility. We also engaged a pilot, PSA pilot, for this uh, mooring operations. We engaged two tacks to help mooring of these uh, vessels. As you know, my previous uh, uh, colleague, my uh, previous speakers pointed out that some company, they have the ocean-going experience, so that, that operates a bit differently. Again, when we talk about bunkering operations, that operates a bit differently. So we, we gel these two. So we took our ocean-going master to be on the vessel as a command of the vessel. Again, we put our bunker tanker master, who is very familiar with this bunkering, mooring, and unmooring operations as a guidance to the master. Then 
we go to the connections and testing. That is basically uh, the host connection, cargo host and vapor host. So what are the precautions we had to take during the connection of, uh, of cargo hoses? So full protective uh, chemical suits was used for this uh, connection uh, of the cargo hoses. We use actually two hoses. One is cargo hoses, another one is uh, vapor hoses so that the vapor can return to the uh, same cargo tanks. Then, of course, uh, my previous, uh, like, uh, speakers have explained about the QCDC, DVC. Yes, we have, it was actually connected with the hose itself before we connect our manifold. Then we, do the, we did the testing of this line after the connection, we used nitrogen. So this case, in fact, we used the nitrogen from the receiving vessel, but we also prepared ourselves, our vessel agility, capable of uh, doing the uh, leak test using the nitrogen. We used portable nitrogen bottles on board. And then uh, bunker delivery we provided with, uh, like we, we, we kept, we supplied uh, the portable uh, nitrogen bottle in case as a backup arrangement of uh, hose uh, testing. Is the uh, bunker delivery operation. Before I move into the bunker delivery operation, I just want to tell you, is conventional uh, bunker uh, delivery operation, we do not carry out tank cleaning, but for this case, we carried out tank cleaning operation for methanol readiness, methanol loading. We also carried out all OS test of the cargo tank. It's maybe new to the uh, bunkering industry, what is all loss test, but those who have sailed on chemical tankers and carried methanol in the past, it is very common. But we did it for this case, as it is the, going to happen for the first time. Then we uh, started the pump with uh, like uh, slow speed, as it has got static electricity hazards. With the static electricity hazards, we have to maintain slow speed of one meter per second for initial discharging, and then gradually we increase the uh, discharging or bunkering rate. When we increase the bunkering rate, we faced an issue like, like uh, the, when the vapor was coming to the same tank, we saw that the vapor pressure was increasing in the same tank. So what we did, actually we prepared early, we kept a backup tank of four starboard. So we open up the four starboard for additional vapor to absorb in that tank. So our purpose was to carry out a closed loading, uh, bunkering operation without releasing any uh, uh, vapor in the atmosphere. As you have uh, seen in the previous slides, that uh, thermal camera, it was actually used during our bunkering operation. When we carried out the delivery operation, uh, we used this camera, uh, and we, we can see the temperature, uh, how it shows. It, it was practically used on board during the bunkering uh, operation. And then uh, for the sampling of this case, this case we used uh, closed sampling device, different from the traditional bunkering. Uh, then we used, uh, before the bunkering commence, we, the surveyor was engaged and took the uh, closed, uh, using closed sampling device, the sample was being taken. Then uh, we have completed the, like, uh, the nominated quantity, and after that, uh, we do the line clearing. The line clearing part also was uh, very important because we had to clear the line with nitrogen, not using traditional air. So the nitrogen, again, we used from the uh, Laura Marx. They had the nitrogen generator, but we had the backup to to uh, use the nitrogen to blow the line back to the uh, receiving vessel tanks. Uh, 
And finally, we uh, like completed everything, uh, checklist, BDN signed, and prepared for departure. We used again the pilot and uh, like uh, tag boards, same as usual uh, for the departure. Most important part here was the crew training part, or what we have explained that uh, the crew training we did uh, apart from STCW training, what is required for type two chemical tanker, we sent our, all our crew to go through uh, uh, that uh, methanol specific firefighting training. As you have seen, the methanol fire is invisible in the broad daylight hours. For these specific operations, we, we, pro, we have provided uh, some items like uh, safety items specifically for this methanol operation, that is a uh, thermal camera, a methanol gas detector, chemical suits, and then we also considered a uh, lightning rod and other uh, safety devices for this uh, methanol operation to happen safely. Uh, before I end uh, these slides, uh, my presentation, what uh, my colleagues, Captain uh, Natarajan has mentioned, Honglam has got the right expertise of bunkering operation as well as uh, chemical operations. So thank you. This uh, I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to MPA to the government agencies and industry partners for taking Honglam in this journey and giving the opportunity to perform uh, this first ever methanol bunkering operation in Singapore water. Uh, we have completed this operation safely on 27th of July, 2023 at Singapore Anchorage. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Captain Kamal. I'd like to keep you on stage, Captain Kamal, to join us back on stage for the panel session. I'm just going to invite you to take seat here. And I'd like to invite back all our earlier speakers as well. And, and our moderator for this session it will be Captain Vibhas Garg. He is the director for Octane Marine Private Limited and the member of the National Maritime Safety at Sea Council Singapore. So we're just going to take a moment to... Um, turn the stage around a little bit for the panel session. And at this juncture, you would like to scan the QR code that's on your name badge that allows you to put in your questions and thoughts based on what you've heard from our speakers earlier and what might come up for you during this panel session. All right, gentlemen, the time is yours. Over to you. Thank you. I saw the last slide tumble and I thought that was the end of the evening. <laughs> yeah, we can go home now. But uh, thankfully, we didn't have to read it fully. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Let's switch gear. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here once again. And uh, I have with me uh, this distinguished panel of speakers who have uh, put together a lot of effort in... Uh, in these presentations, and uh, the gist of it is uh, started with Natarajan, who uh, explained the blueprint and the conceptualization of, of, uh, of this bunkering here. And then Samuel gave us uh, the port state's perspective and the preparations they made. Vivin spoke about methanol, its availability challenges, regulatory issues from a class perspective. Dinesh explained the operations uh, from the receiving uh, vessel's perspective uh, from an owner with very deep pockets. Uh, and then Kamal filled us in uh, with respect to the operations uh, of the bunker supplier, their perspective. Thank you, gentlemen, for some wonderful uh, presentations. I have got a long list of questions, so be prepared to stay here till 7 p.m. <laughs> Unless you help me in asking some Tiny, tiny questions. Um, but uh, yeah, let's start with, uh, with a poll that we sent out. A very, very simple poll. I think uh, it's a question, 
in all our minds about these alternate fuels. Can we have the pre-event poll, please? Right, very simple. What is the alternative uh, fuel of the future? And uh, we've got three options here, biofuel, ammonia, and methanol. Methanol scores 40%. Uh, maybe because we are presenting methanol today, but uh, 10 years back when we were building ships, this was not even on the horizon. We were looking at dual fuel ships with LNG. I remember if anybody told me methanol, dual fuel, I would have just looked at him like this, uh, impossible. But yeah, see how things have changed. And we're talking about methanol and ammonia and biofuel, and what is missing here is probably hydrogen and nuclear fuels, which is way, way ahead. But um, I think uh, we all know that it's not going to be a one fuel story. We, we all understand it's going to be a multiple fuel. Uh, from a DNB report that I read uh, a few months back, we will have uh, ammonia on uh, one third of the ships by 2050, and we will have uh, methanol on one-fifth of the ships by 2050. But yes, as somebody said, uh, in this decade till 2030, methanol does seem to be the most uh, logical solution. Take up expected to be 3% of the fleet by 2030, ammonia just 1%. And of course, biofuels is, is ongoing. But before we start with the questions, uh, let me, let me uh, start with uh, one question for Vibin. First of all, Vibin, please explain to me these beautiful colors of methanol, you know, the brown, the gray, the green, and the blue also. And, and if, you can, if you can explain to us what are the benefits of methanol compared to the other alternative fuels here? Okay, uh, to start with the demarcation of green methanol, so there, there are two essential components for green methanol. So renewable energy is one of them. And again, uh, the second portion is depending on what green methanol you are using. So if you're using the e-methanol, uh, you need the renew renewable energy for the hydrogen production and for the direct air capture. Likewise, if you're using uh, biomethanol, you, you need the sustainable source of biomass uh, supply for biomethanol. Uh, the key difference of methanol compared to the other fuels, I would say, is uh, the capex and your opex uh, cost. So uh, I, think, I think with uh, different kinds of fuels, uh, what we have, methanol gives you a better opportunity for retrofit uh, price-wise. Uh, if you're if you looking at emission-wise, uh, it is from a tank to wake perspective, it's very similar to the convention fuel, but when you are looking in a well to wake and, uh, I mean, sorry, in a well to wake basis, that's where you get more of the savings. Uh, so separating them in tank to, uh, well to tank and tank to wake, well to tank is where most of the GHG saving comes from. And depending on your feedstock, there is an, al there is an opportunity that the GHG, total GHG emissions, it can also be a negative way. So uh, that, that's one of the key uh, advantages of methanol, I would say. Okay, okay so the methanol, yeah, sorry, Jibish, yeah, please. Just to add, like he talked about the retrofit, the advantage of methanol being is the methanol technology is already there. Means uh, 2015 Sterna Germanica's uh, first passenger vessel, which is operated on methanol dual fuel. And if you see currently almost close to 20 or 22 ships are on water with uh, operating in methanol dual fuel. Means, uh, so the considering uh, the technology wise, people are talking about ammonia. Yes, it's a zero carbon fuel, but still the engine is not there. But when you compare to methanol, already engine is there. And if you see the capex cost for a new building, 
because already methanol dual, two, uh, dual fuel tankers are there, but uh, I'm talking about the bulk areas, other sectors. I'm not sure about the container vessel. Maybe Musk can tell what is the price because they don't ever disclose what is the price for what they're paying. But for the bulk areas, we know because we are working as a Mitsui, we are uh, working joint venture partners. We just order a vessel. The cost will be around five to six million extra for the normal conventional fuel bulk carrier. This is about the Kamsar Max price. It's uh, just a ballpark figure. And uh, I'm not sure about the retrofit cost because uh, still the retrofitting part is being developed. But it's uh, easy to do conversion compared to if you are going to retrofit a vessel with ammonia, it will be easy to do a retrofitting with methanol rather than doing it with ammonia or other fuels. This is my take. Yeah, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Jagdish. Um, before we take uh, questions uh, from the audience, let me uh, run a very simple uh, poll over here. It's just a simple question. Can I run the first, first poll? This is regarding the safety of uh, methanol. And, uh, you know, methanol is, is dangerous for uh, any sort of ingestion. And uh, we have all these uh, issues here, inhalation, uh, breathing by vapors, ingestion, skin contact, eye contact. And we ran a poll, which is the most uh, dangerous of this. And what's the answer? We have ingestion is 45.5% and inhalation by breathing vapors is 54.5%. Okay. Uh, do we have the answer also here? Can you flash the answer? The Okay, well, the, the, the answer actually, which uh, is not on the screen, is, uh, is ingestion, physical ingestion, which means that 10 ml of methanol will cause blindness and 30 ml is fatal. What I'm trying to show from this poll is, is uh, how dangerous methanol can be. And uh, Dinesh, maybe you can highlight to us as to the safety of this fuel, um, having first-hand experience of having it on your ships now. Yeah, I think from a safety and health hazards perspective, uh, you can uh, relate to two of the properties of uh, methanol fuel, right? Uh, we already talked about uh, methanol being toxic, and then we talked about methanol uh, being flammable. Uh, primarily, all the hazards come from the, these two properties. So if we talk about uh, toxicity uh, and, and the related health hazard, uh, like we looked at here, uh, it, it is around uh, inhalation of vapors coming from methanol. Uh, and then you have the, um, the skin contact. Uh, and then uh, you have the eye contact as a uh, hazard. Uh, and, and lastly, the uh, ingestion, uh, which is probably the most uh, severe of the hazards. Uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, operationally, uh, the precautions that we can take uh, depends on uh, the risks uh, that is involved and also the quantity of exposure. So if you have a, a low quantity exposure uh, in an operation, uh, then primarily your uh, traditional way of PPE uh, your boiler suits, your goggles, uh, your safety shoes, and your gloves would be sufficient uh, for, for normal exposure. Whereas if you have a high risk, high quantity exposure, uh, then you would have to use uh, PPE uh, similar to what you use for chemicals. So you'll need to have your chemical suits, uh, breathing apparatus, uh, you need to have uh, uh, special gloves, um, so, so, so the requirements then change in, in terms of PPE. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the flammability, uh, the safety risks, uh, we already talked about in the slides in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sparks, uh, the environment uh, with cargo operations, uh, then that can uh, result in a uh, dangerous situation uh, because uh, methanol is flammable and, and can uh, be an explosive uh, if, if not safely handled. 
So which means, uh, you know, like we talked about in the slide, the hazard uh, identification and segregation uh, into different zones is very important. Uh, activities uh, uh, such as uh, hot work, um, you know, welding, uh, or even uh, carrying electronic equipment uh, around these uh, hazardous areas uh, could be dangerous. Um, so, you know, the crew training, um, your procedures uh, around how you handle uh, these um, uh, fluids is, is very important. Uh, but back to, uh, you know, ingestion, the, the point that you made around it, it can be, you know, fatal. Uh, you know, I just had a reflection, you know, through years of operations, we've seen even with, uh, you know, something like a paint thinner, I don't know how many of you have experienced, we've seen uh, situations where crew have uh, filled paint thinner in water bottles and, and crew have actually consumed it thinking it was water. Imagine this situation with methanol. If, if somebody poured in, into a water bottle and somebody consumed it, it can be fatal. So, so it's so important uh, that we create this awareness around uh, methanol. Thank you. Uh, Kamal has got something to add to that. I want to add something on it. Uh, because uh, we know methanol is a colorless, volatile, toxic, and flammable liquid. So all the hazardous properties actually methanol has got. Again, those who have uh, carried uh, ca methanol as a cargo and all, it's not so dangerous cargo. It's not categorized as highly dangerous cargo, but it has got all the properties of uh, hazardous uh, properties. So what happened? Even in our uh, first uh, methanol bunkering, what we did, we prepared a PPE matrix. That is very important. Like in which scenario, what the crew needs to be put on. So the PPE matrix uh, like uh, uh, inhalation, ingestion, that to prevent that chemical, uh, the crew shall be, uh, shall put uh, the chemical suits, uh, uh, especially during connection, disconnection. Again, when uh, this uh, methanol vapors, like uh, what you can see that methanol vapors can stay in the atmosphere as long as 18 days. It's not that immediately disappearing. So if there is a source of uh, leakage and the vapor keeps coming, and if there is a spark in another area, what we have seen in Samuel's uh, video uh, slides in the first, that is very dangerous. So when we are doing methanol operation, one important thing, there shall not be any hot talk in that adjacent area. That is very important. Again, uh, inhalation or ingestion of methanol, it, it affects like, it, it may not be immediate, but 30 minutes on or later, you can expect the uh, feedback. So if somebody got affected or uh, just inhalation or digestion or whatever, then he should, uh, w even he may not feel immediately, but 30 minutes on or later, he start feeling dizziness and all. So that should be uh, taken care of well. Uh, for this uh, preparation. So what I should say, for uh, especially in terms of bunkering operation, the crew need to have proper PPE matrix and to follow accordingly. That can help uh, prevent uh, all the unexpected events. Thank you. Uh, just one more point to add. Uh, in terms of ingestion, uh, if, if, if somebody ingests uh, by mistake methanol, uh, then the best antidote is actually uh, ethanol. Uh, so it can be administered intravenous, and, and that's the best antidote. Yeah. So you get drunk, basically. Yeah. That's what it, yeah. Well, I, I like your optimism, gentlemen, that methanol is, uh, is, is OK for bunkering. But uh, to me, it doesn't sound music to the ears. Being a tanker man, it, it sounds pretty dangerous. And uh, that brings up one question. I mean, think of what it takes to train somebody for a chemical tanker carrying methanol, right? How many years of training before we feel confident that he can do deck watches? And now we are talking of 20% of the world fleet where we have got people who have never, ever loaded dangerous cargo involved in bunkering, right? And we heard a lot about human factors this morning. And I saw your poor leaves, and uh, though you were surprised with it, Actually, I was not, because I think 
that is the concern of a ship manager. I remember when we were trying to train our people for bunkering LNG for a new build dual fuel ship just two years back. And we just couldn't manage to train these guys because we didn't have any gas fleet, gas ships in our fleet. There was no way that we could train people. And the regulations were very strict. Now that's LNG, cryogenic cargo. So my question coming back to human factor is that what are we doing actually to set standards in place? And Samuel, I'm looking at you now. What are we doing to set standards in place to carry out all that you guys have shown to make sure that that happens for this guy on a 20,000 ton handy max who knows nothing about dangerous cargoes? Thanks for the question. Um, so I think what we're gonna, what we have to do is there are a few different um, parts to it. So the first is, as I mentioned earlier, um, for domestic bunkering standards. So if you're going to do bunkering in Singapore, you have to follow certain bunkering standards for our bunker craft operators and bunker suppliers. So that is something that we are working on mm -hmm. together with industry stakeholders through the through Enterprise Singapore's uh, standard development process, um, and the working groups will be set up. And we've already, we, we would know that similar to LNG, the bunkering standards will have to also cover crew training. Not just how you supply the methanol, but how you do crew training. So that will take care of domestic needs. But of course, it's not just that, right? When you bunker ships internationally, they're coming from all over the world. So that's why I also highlighted that it's important that we look beyond just domestic bunkering standards. We have to look at STCW requirements. That's also why we try to highlight some of these to the IMO, so that other member states, even if you have not done methanol bunkering yet, you are aware that your ships under your flag will need to think about how to do this, and then hopefully we can come together and look at how to improve the SCCW requirements. And before SCCW requirements come in place, uh, for the first few methanol ships, that's where we have to rely on the shipping companies and work with them that if you want to do methanol bunkering in Singapore, we would also ask you, not just our bunker op operator, but also ask the shipping company, have you sent your crew for training, which is similar to what we did with MERS. And we want to be assured that their crew are also safe because if anything happens in our port, their crew will be affected, we will also be affected. So it, it's not just Singapore that's doing this alone, we need to work with the international community. Thanks. Finish? Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a good point. Of course, uh, training, uh, you know, bringing in uh, certain regulations will, will uh, you know, address the uh, problem that you posed in your question. Uh, but I also believe, apart from this, uh, we need to build systems and process that is robust enough to, you know, let people fail safely. I think we need to account for it. And, and as an industry, we have that responsibility uh, to let people fail safely. So our systems and processes need to be robust enough. And, and adding to that, I think one of our speakers in the morning spoke about connecting with our front line. We really need to connect with our front line and understand and establish that feedback loop on how the systems are working. You know, is, 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 is there anything that is not working? Can we do things differently? People at our front line are our experts. I, I think it is so important to understand this and then work with our systems and processes. Thank you. Trajan, I have a question for you. And you very graciously offered to answer this before. Now, we produce, I, I, I've read this somewhere, 100 million tons of methanol today. Most of it is, uh, is brown and uh, gray. 45% is being used as fuel. It's methanol is a history of being used as a fuel, 100 years, right? And now we want to go into bunkering for ships. Thank you for the lovely start on your vessels. And you need 700,000 tons of methanol by 2025. So that's 2% of today's production, considering that today's production is not even green. Where are we going to get it? Okay, I have to quote from uh, Methanol Institute because uh, they are tracking almost uh, as per the latest uh, 
in their website they are tracking almost close to 80 methanol renewable projects happening around the world so as per their projection it's supposed to be i think uh, even vibin has shown in his slide the same slide so as per them like for example by 2025 there will be going to be a 4.5 million tons of means not the gray methanol it is going to be a bio or e methanol which will reduce your carbon and by 2027 it is going to be close to 8 million metric tons this is as quoted by methanol institute and the projects are running worldwide means the problem now is now nobody knows what is the demand actual demand because now we have the musk which is delivering a lot of vessels so we know the musk demand but for the players to come in, we know to know when, when there is a demand, the supply will ramp up. Currently, people are waiting and watching. And also, the infrastructure to develop, deliver the bunkers means, for example, if you are producing biomethanol or e-methanol, how to deliver? Like, for example, Singapore, okay, we deliver by a chemical. So in the future, bunker uh, barges, methanol bunker barges is going to come in. So all this thing has to be looked up. And also, regarding the projects, what I told you is in the Asia side, China is ramping up very fast. There are already 18 projects running in China. And other than that, in Japan, as well as uh, India, there are one green methanol or biomethanol projects. In the total worldwide, it is close to 50 projects being running in. So it is based on the current situation, but we are not know the actual quantity. So, but the main important point here is all are waiting for the demand, means what demand is expected and the musk is playing independently because uh, they are already directly going to the suppliers they are sourcing the methanol so it cannot be done by all the players like what being done by musk so i think the demand uh, will create the supply actually i think it is uh, it will happen because we are expecting yeah. ammonia but uh, we are also telling ammonia as a net zero fuel but ammonia is now not enough for as a fertilizer so where you are going to get the fuel? That is another question we will not discuss here. So this is the thing. So methanol will come up. Yes. Vivian? Uh, I just want to add to that. So uh, when we are talking about green methanol itself, uh, the life cycle of uh, fuel, uh, the emissions of uh, life cycle emissions of the fuel uh, is not mandated yet. So until that point, even the fossil methanol usage would make sense. Uh, that there won't be much GHG reduction, but I think, I think there is significant improvement on the CII rating. So fossil methanol uh, can be used as a transition until the green methanol is kind of significantly available. So uh, yeah, uh, that, that's the point. So it may not contribute to the GHG reduction, but it kind of improves the CII rating of the vessel. Okay. Um. Let me uh, ask one question to uh, Dinesh. We spoke about vapors and uh, the, the vapor emission uh, being dangerous. Uh, methanol, I believe, you don't detect it uh, till it's 2000 unless you have all the gas machinery. Now, we know that containers are stuffed with cargo, which sometimes ship staff are not aware of. Container fires have been in focus. And now we're talking about having a fuel. And I know you mentioned safety zones of 100 meters and all, but how do you, how do you kind of take care of uh, what's in the containers next to the vents for methanol or stuff like that? What is the difference? Is, is the ship's designed differently with respect to firefighting systems and stuff like that? In, in terms of uh, ship design, uh, yes, uh, there are certain requirements uh, for instance, the uh, methanol storage tanks uh, need to have uh, coffer dams around it. Uh, you know, the treatment of the fuel cannot take place within the engine room, so that has to be outside engine room. Uh, the piping um, that comes uh, to the engine uh, has to be uh, a double walled. Uh, so, so there are these, um, uh, you know, design requirements that make sure it is safer. Um, in, in terms of cargo, um, yes, there, there, there would be some requirements, at least from a, a bunker operational, uh, you know, bunkering point of view. I already mentioned around the, uh, the segmentation of zones and, and not having uh, hazardous cargo in, in those zones. So, so we have to closely work with storage to ensure 
that these dangerous cargoes uh, are not stored close to these zones. But having said that, uh, you know, like you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, not just with, with regards to methanol, but in general, I think we have a problem in terms of uh, understanding what is in the containers. So that's something even at Maersk, uh, we are trying to solve that. Um, you know, we recently had a, had a fire uh, because uh, somebody was transporting an uh, EV vehicle in a container, a used EV vehicle. Uh, so these are things that we are constantly working on to strengthen uh, you know, the process around uh, cargo loading. Thank you. Kamal, I'll touch a little bit on the quality side of things. Uh, uh, methanol is uh, very, very, uh, it's friendly with water, and uh, that's one of the biggest risks of having water contamination. How do you ensure that your tanks are uh, free of that? And, and also one question for you, especially with regards to all the investments owners are going to make in going for this, how do you ensure that the fuel that you're carrying, methanol, is green? I mean, in quality perspective and not the other colors. Oh, okay, so that's what uh, I mentioned uh, this, uh, First of all, our tanks, uh, vessel tanks shall be cleaned. That is perfectly cleaned. And uh, this quality, what we receive from the terminal, that should maintain that when it is loaded on board, it should not degrade further. So our tanks, lines, everything should be cleaned enough to maintain the quality. Now in terms of uh, E-methanol or gray methanol or it is mostly depends on the, uh, the uh, receiver side, what their contracts, which types of methanol they are going to supply. As a carrier of uh, like a banker tanker, in context of banker tanker or carrier, we just ensure what we loaded, we delivered the same. And for that, our uh, tanks, lines, pipes shall be cleaned enough, our crew trained enough to handle the methanol safely. Uh, and then we deliver the job as per outlined procedures. That I can uh, say about it. Thank you. So there are no quality standards. Yeah, Vivian. So currently only uh, the MSDS is exchanged during the bunkering, and that's the only document that shows that your fuel is uh, biomethanol or e-methanol or, or fossil methanol. So uh, that's the only information exchanged at the moment with the BDN. Uh, but soon when you have the fuel certifications mandated, uh, that will be kind of a formal documentation that will kind of describe that what kind of methanol is being transferred or exchanged. Yeah. But yeah, it's a yeah. work in progress. Yeah, so. I just want to add to this that I think um, in this regard, this, uh, the final regulatory requirements and so on are not out, but the way forward would probably be certification. You already see this happening with biofuel, where customers are already asking the bunker suppliers and the upstream suppliers to show that the biofuel is from a sustainable source, uh, whether the, what is the feedstock of the biofuel and so on. So there's already this demand in the market to show where biofuel is sourced from. And likely this will also play out in the other fuels, where it's, whether it's methanol, ammonia, or so on. That there will be a need for certification of the supply chain as well. Okay, I'm getting signs from there that this clock is running out. A long list of questions, but I shall ask you the last one. How are you going to apply this to ammonia? Anyone? Okay, regulatory wise, again, uh, the requirements are very similar to LPG for ammonia. So uh, I think, I think uh, the only factor that as regulator I'll be concerned is traditionally we are relying on this uh, single failure design criteria which uh, could be an oversight in case of ammonia as fuel. So uh, the traditional approach of single failure criteria, uh, criteria is equivalent design, equivalent safety, uh, is something which may not be comfortable for regulators. And we may go back and look into the vessel operations of LPG and what kind of industry safety standards were used for that particular operation. And probably those kind of uh, 
uh, training or safety requirements will be brought back as a regulatory requirement into the rules. So uh, the basic uh, safety requirements doesn't stop with a single failure, failure criteria for us. Uh, so there, there will be at least two or three levels of safety which we may want to mandate as a basic uh, requirement. Samuel, when is ammonia coming? So I think there are a few aspects. Um, so on regulatory aspects, uh, just to highlight that, I think as uh, our speaker from IMO mentioned this morning, there are discussions ongoing at the Triple C Committee on requirements for ammonia field vessels. Uh, there, there were also discussions at the recent Triple C on what should be the safety principle, whether it's a gas safe principle or using an emergency shutdown principle. So things like double piping and so on will also be applied to ammonia. So there will be some learnings from methanol. From the bunkering port perspective, I think, uh, as I shared earlier, the methodology that we use to prepare for the first methanol bunkering operation would be similarly applied for ammonia. The risk would be different for ammonia. The toxicity is a greater factor than flammability. But similarly, we would have to go through exercises, uh, hazard identification. We have to think about the mitigation measures on board the ship, on board the bunkering vessel, and also for the port itself. So the, those would be a similar approach on methanol would be applied. And similar to methanol bunkering, we are also going to start work on the ammonia bunkering standards. Even if the, we foresee that the first ships are probably in the water in a few years' time, based on the timeline of the ammonia engine development at the moment. So that's what we're preparing ourselves for. And MPA ourselves, we are also involved in uh, several industry projects. Uh, the Castor Initiative, uh, there's a consortium with Itochu. There's also a Sabre project with uh, several other companies as well. So we are tracking and working with the industry on this as well. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, clocks is showing zero, 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 zero. Um, from what I gather, very interesting. Singapore makes, as, as always, a proactive stance, goes ahead and does something which is still uh, a little bit futuristic. I can say for the engineers in this room, life is gonna get very tough for you. When it comes to bunkering, it's not just going to be simply open the valve and psh, 14 unit takes the soundings, no more. Uh, it's going to be a lot more uh, risky, whether it is uh, methanol or it is ammonia. But uh, what's good is that uh, we are waking up to the reality and uh, we are preparing for it and I think uh, for the first time, I'm seeing this industry, some, some proactive, uh, I've seen it before, but in bits and pieces, but yeah, now it's, it's really happening. And uh, yeah, things are falling in place. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your interest and uh, for your uh, time. Uh, thank you to all the uh, speakers for some excellent presentations. And thanks to MPA for inviting us today. Appreciate that summary. Thank you, Captain Vibas, for moderating. Gentlemen as well, Captain Jagadisan, um, Mr. Samuel, Mr. Bibin, and Mr. Dinesh for sharing your perspectives with us and taking the questions as we went along. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And if you really felt like you enjoyed yourself and learned something, another round of applause, shall we, for all the speakers, whether this panel, the earlier ones, and in your midst as well, I'm sure you've had uh, many exchanges that were enriching this afternoon. So as we round off to the end, I have to say that your active participation and presence in this room really made a difference. So thank you and kudos to all of you for showing up. For those of you um, who sign up tomorrow for session three and four, uh, we really look forward to see you then. But for now, as we round off today, it's a good time to just take stock of what you felt was good. So I'm just gonna flash up on the screen the QR code for the feedback form, a quick one. Just scan in there. Give us your thoughts, what you like, what you wished more of, uh, and, and hopefully we want to implement that. And um, next to it, quiz number two. Please take part, okay? Because we're going to pick uh, a few lucky winners who walk home with $50 Amazon vouchers for correct answers. Try, just scan. Yeah, it's just, you know, a quick one, and you never know you could walk home, walk home with that. Um, so please participate if you can. Uh, that's it. Tomorrow's session, three and four. Signing up, who's coming back? Show of hands. 
Awesome. I'll see you tomorrow. Great. Making the most of your time here in Singapore as well. Uh, so those of you who flew in as well, I hope it's been a good, you know, enriching session. Tomorrow we're talking about building a cyber safe and resilient maritime ecosystem, as well as enhancing maritime safety through technology. Sure, going to be a long day uh, with great lineup of speakers as well. I'm looking forward to be back with you tomorrow for uh, a time of learning and, of course, exchanging of uh, wonderful perspectives and experiences. So, ladies and gentlemen, you deserve a well, uh, a rest after a good day of learning. So, thank you so much for joining us on day one. Have a great rest, and we'll see you back here fresh tomorrow. It's been a pleasure. My name is Carissa Seat. Have a great evening. See you. Mm -hmm.